will be a very sacred gathering today as, as the song says, and we would go beyond this tiny instant, this instant where this is the thought where everyone comes to this world, all who come to this world come for death and sorrow. That's the definition of coming. You can call it whatever you want, incarnation or or arriving in a hologram or holding on to a hologram, but it's all who come, come for one purpose, and that's death and sorrow. And their joys are so fleeting that they cannot be possessed nor even grasped, nor even grasped. You might think of fingers just trying to get a wisp of joy, mm -hmm. and joy eludes the mind that believes it's in this world. You know, all these compromised ideas, that as long as you're still here, you're not enlightened, and so forth. So Jesus says in his manual for teacher, he says that the one, there is one teacher needed to save the world, and that one is not a body or in a body. Mm -hmm. He makes it very clear the distinction of who is the savior of the world. That's so why when people say, "My personal," you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ is my personal savior. That doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it because the Christ is not a body or in a body. It's a symbol that's being used. And Krishna was saying today how grateful she is for the symbol. Because it's like the Holy Spirit doesn't take a form. The Holy Spirit is, is literally like we can't see the wind. The Holy Spirit is really unmanifest. And Jesus seemed to be, of all the cosmic images, he seemed to be an image that was a reflection of, of the Holy Spirit. Even though the Holy Spirit, Jesus says you cannot, the Word of God was made flesh. Strictly speaking, Jesus says in the Course, this is impossible. Because the Word is Spirit, and the Word can never be made flesh. And Mary Baker Eddy, you might have heard of her too, you have no mind and matter, there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence. So, I think what a, what a glorious opportunity we have today to go beyond the tiny instant, to the experience of joy, to again, you know, look at anything that seems to be an obstacle to the awareness of love's presence, or an attachment, or something in form that seems valuable, because any of those things mean the same thing. Anything that's valued in and of itself in this world, even that fly that's going around, has been going around for the last two days, <laughs> he's joining us, anything that is seen in and of itself or valued in and of itself is by definition an idol, made to take the place of the, the living Christ. And so, that's what our joy is, living the experience of being free of, of attachments, free of ambitions, free of pursuits, free of reciprocity, free of exchange, free of, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back, free of bargains, free of everything that would limit the mind to believe that it's in time and space, and soar into an experience of pure joy which is which is transcendent, which is mystical, and which is our whole purpose, to, to see and experience ourselves as beyond this world. So, with all the metaphors, I like that song, that's a good kickoff song, Only an Instant Does This World Endure. Not something we generally heard at the kitchen table when we were growing up from mom and dad. Only an instant does this world endure. It was always about the future, or the past. It was always deflecting away from the Holy Instant. All of our conditioning, everything we were raised with, the whole thing, we bought it hook, line and sinker. A, a, a complete illusion that has nothing to do with reality whatsoever. And then we have to go into the Holy Instant. We have to have an experience of the Holy Instant to know that the separation never happened to, it's just one instant, but it's like, what's it going to be? Holy, holiness, or sin and death? Which phase of the, of the moment are we going to accept? It's not two moments, really. 
they, they aren't even side by side because the Holy Spirit answered the belief in separation simultaneously as the belief arose. So it wasn't, it was, it was that fast that we have to decide which of those two interpretations we value more. Innocence or guilt. And it's one instant. So, I, the section from the Course that's coming to mind is the immediacy of salvation. Where Jesus is saying, why would the good, he asks a question, he asks a direct question to the mind. Why should the good appear in evil's form? Why should the good appear in evil's form? We watched this movie, God's Not Dead, and there's a black man from South, South Africa who's always saying, God is good. And always, God is... Okay. Hmm? All the time, always, God is good. God is good. If we come into a non-dualistic, goodness being love. God is love, all the time, God is love, God is love, God is love. Why should the love appear in evil's form? Why should the good appear in evil's form? This is from the immediacy of salvation section, late in the text of the Course. Why should it take time to experience what you already are? Why should the good appear in evil's form? Why are there perceived difficulties around health, or around finances, or around the world, or around relationships, or around anything? Why should the good appear in evil's form. And then he follows up his question with another question, and is it not deception if it does? It's so deep. He's just saying, why should the good appear in evil's form? And is it not deception if it does? No wonder he has less than 135. A healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. No wonder he put the I need do nothing section in the book. A much misinterpreted <laughs> uh, piece in the book because it's interpreted from the ego lens of doing as if the doer is a fact. And now this doer need do nothing. This doer need only be. Well, this doer is, is a denial. What did Shakespeare teach us? To be or not to be, that is the question. And I was saying that only an hour ago. And there was questions of whether it would be a wedding today or not. I said, to be or not to be, that is the only question. This isn't a question of a wedding or no wedding. We have not come here to discuss such silly matters. We have not come for ceremonies. We have not come to play with little ideas, children's toys, and tinker around. It's to be Shakespeare's question, to be or not to be, is the question. And then Jesus is saying, why should the good appear in evil's form? He's, he's sending us toward the be. He's, he's not going to be content with the not to be. And, and who could, let's see, lesson 139, I will accept atonement for myself. In the Course, the Workbook Lesson, he says, You are yourself. Of that there is no doubt. And yet, you doubt it. Mm -hmm. The only thing in the universe, the only thing in the universe that you cannot doubt is your identity. It's who you are. That's the absolute only thing in the universe that's, that's beyond doubt. And yet, you doubt it. Self-doubt is fear. Self-doubt is guilt. To deny who you are is the only thing. That's how the song ends. We would go beyond this instant to eternity. To identity, identity, identity. <laughs> eternity, eternity, eternity. You know, it's an intense song because it's like eternity sending out a plea to say, remember me, remember me. That's all in the Lion King, that's what Simba's father says from the clouds. Remember, remember, we have an identity. Don't get caught in the pride land, don't get caught in a kuna matala, eating bugs. You know, it's not, it's, you may think it's a good life. 
you're not working and you're eating bugs, but still remember, don't be content with the bugs. So these are <laughs> all these are all important things because we're talking about we we call it mysticism, or as Francis likes to call it, mystism, <laughs> which I looked out on the ocean of water today. And I said, now that is mystic, mystism, <laughs> the belief in mist. But we're interested in mysticism, and we enjoy the laugh with mysticism as well. But but that's why we're all here, to make it the most practical gathering. And as more guests arrive, this is one of those fun gatherings where it's going to be like a layer cake. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the layer, then we are going to have more layers and more layers, and we'll see if there'll be a couple on the top or not. <laughs> we are in the middle of the wedding cake, and we, we are practicing the early workbook lessons of the course. I do not know what anything is for, and I don't think they do either. So, that's, but that's why they'll come in. I, I'm trusting that all this is nothing is random. It's, it's happening this way. It's going to turn into one heck of a parable. Oh, yeah. First time ever, it will be, this will be the wedding cake parable. Yes. And as we discuss the holy instant. And, so that's what I want to throw out. Is there anything really worth valuing in the thoughts of this world? Because that's what all these sections of the Course are about. Attraction to pain, attraction to guilt, attraction to death. Why? Who would put such morbid topics in a book unless they were important? You, those three subsections are together. Attraction to pain, attraction to guilt, attraction to death. There's some strange, that's the unholy instance, some strange spell that has been cast. The mist has fallen over the planet, and like with Siddhartha. It's a mist, and, and everybody's under a spell, everybody's asleep in the Siddhartha story. And he has to leave the palace, he has to go and follow the song that he hears, to leave the sleeping mist, to go out. And he goes through asceticism, which is trying to push away the comforts and pleasures of the world. And he has to go through meditation and all of the different temptations as he leaves the palace. But we want to go so deeply into this. We were talking about the Gnostics too, how the Gnostics were right at the same time of Christ, right after Christ, Gnosticism was very strong, and they actually believed that the world was an illusion. But they had some strange practices, they, they actually believed because of this illusion they could indulge in all the pleasures of the world, and do it as much as they could to prove that it was an illusion, and it didn't work. Why? Because pleasure and pain are the same trick. And Jesus says it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. But who on earth hasn't seemed to enjoy the pleasure? That's what keeps the mind stuck in the unholy instant. That's what the mesmerism is all about. If, if the world was only pain, if every decision you ever made on planet earth was pain, would it be difficult to hit the eject button and to fly <laughs> and be free of the world if it was all pain and there was no attraction to it? If every single decision was seen as death, if every turn was seen as death, would you take a turn? There would still be the fear of, of returning because as you're what you fear is not the fear, what you fear most is not the fear, it is the love that you will meet when you return. So I have this feeling that we can't, we'll keep on choosing death and pain because we're afraid of what will meet us when we let go of it. What return means, yeah. return to heaven. So the attraction of pain and death becomes the escape from what will happen when we return. So that's sounding very much like the movie Inception, like layers of dreaming, because there's some kind of fear that's greater than earthquakes yeah, and tornadoes, exactly. greater yeah. than the death of the it's body. It's the idea that it will be worse. It's the idea. Yeah. So, it's, so you might say it is kind of an interesting mesmerism. You'd have to be convinced mm -hmm. that what you perceive, is true. even if it's uh, not so great all the time, yeah. that it's better, yeah. that duality, yeah. And opposites are actually better than 
return. And I, Jesus had a very interesting thing to say in the Course about the word return. Do you ever read that part of the Course? <laughs> Jesus says the ego likes the idea of return. He actually says that in the Course. Those are his exact English words. The ego likes the idea of return. Why? He continues on the rest of the sentences. Anybody remember what the rest of the sentence is? The ego likes the idea of return, comma, because it can make the idea difficult. Because return is another concept. How, if it's a journey without distance to a goal that never changed, wouldn't return have to be another trick? How can you return to what you never left? You see? A cat chasing its tail, mm -hmm. but the ego likes the idea of return. Oh. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. We talk all the time about return to love, return to God. Yeah. Return to love, I think. Mary Ann Williamson even titled her book, <laughs> Return to Love. And the ego likes the idea of return. She didn't mm -hmm. have the book. Mm -hmm. Because it can make the idea difficult. Yeah. So, how clever, how sneaky, how ingenious mm -hmm this puff of nothingness is, where it, it even likes the idea of return because it can make it difficult. Yeah. This is why we have to go beyond conceptual understanding of the Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. This is why Jesus says you will believe this Course entirely or not at all. Mm -hmm. no, no bonuses for good tries. Trust not your good intentions. It's in there. This Course will be believed entirely or not at all. So this is it's not about a conceptual understanding of the Course. That always seems to come first, because if you're reading a book, yeah. and it's called a Course, you're going to try to grasp at it. But it's going to be like one of those rides, the rotor. If anybody ever remembers the rotor from amusement parks, it's the one where you press your, you stand and press your back against the wall, and then the, it spins. And then, as it spins more and more, the floor drops out. That if you practice A Course in Miracles, mm -hmm. conceptually, and with great passion and determination, and great desire for the experience the Course points to, not the conceptual theology, because that has to drop along with the rest of the floor, there's an experience that will come, he says in the clarification of terms, that will end your doubting. An experience will come that will end your doubting. And seek that experience. Don't seek for conceptual understandings. You can't find joy conceptually. I have a lot of people who tell me, I haven't hit the joy point. I, I feel times of release. I feel times of, of healing relief. I do feel miraculous times. I've had miracles in my life. But I haven't hit joy. Because joy has to be consistent miracles. You have to be consistently right-minded to hit the peak of joy. Not just a stab, a stab of joy. Jesus even, even points about a stab of joy, a stab of pleasure. He even uses the word stab to be how fleeting and brief is what a little stab is. So that's what this interaction is this afternoon, is like an invitation to, to really, for all of us to look closely at what is it that I still value about this world, it can even be a thought, a little tiny thought, that would have me believe that there actually is a future different from the past. Which I say, actually, the future is the same. I call it the future past and the past past, just to emphasize the point that it's all the past. That's why the, not the uh, mystics or the uh, Psychics can read the future, because they're not reading reading the future. Mm -hmm. They're reading the Akashic Records, they're reading, reading the past, and they, it's only the belief that the future is different from the past. That is the cause, the root cause of all <coughs> suffering in this world, the belief that the future is different from the past. How could you have ambition if you knew mm -hmm. that your ambition was actually a death wish? Mm -hmm. That what's so common in this time-space world? Oh, you're, that, you might remember that line from the movie Gandhi, where he's walking down in South Africa with the American journalist named Walker, and Walker says to him, Mr. Gandhi, this is an ashram he's building in South Africa, Mr. Gandhi, 
you're quite an ambitious fellow, the American says to Gandhi. And Gandhi's reply, I hope not. Mm -hmm. Some, I remember when I first was in the theater watching Gandhi, I just, that was so fun to hear those three words. Because that's a common thing in the Western world, the civilized world. Maybe not among the Aborigines. They're probably not an ambitious, they don't, they don't really have a lot of ambition in their culture because they're very into the moment and telepathy. But for the Western world, to have no ambition is you are a bum, you are lazy, you are not a contributing member of society, you have no value, you're a castaway. We call it in America welfare. <laughs> if you are not ambitious, you are on welfare, or I guess they have a word for it over in Denmark. Yeah, it's probably the same, same word. Same, same word. Same yeah. word. Just, just the thing. Same yeah. Danish version of the same yeah, word. Yeah. And that's not a good word. And when you look at it closely, welfare, farewell. Yeah. <laughs> you can say farewell or well, faring well. Is actually, I'm going to stir up political. I've just lost the entire <laughs> politic, political system of the United States with that one. But, but truly, mm. faring well is to say farewell yeah. to the world, to all aspects. So, so this is really, this is where we get into the deeper experience, is to say, well, what is it, if you journal, you said, oh, I still like my cat, or I still like, I have, a, I have good investments. I have a good nest egg that allows me to travel, and that, that, that's the same idea. It's a death wish, you know, recycled. I have amazing support from the world. I get government assistance, or I get, I get by with a little help from my friends. Even that, <laughs> if you're dependent on your friends, that is still the death wish. Because in Lesson 76, Jesus actually puts friendship among economics and nutrition. He calls it the laws of friendship are, e are even made up by the ego. Even, even friendship is part of the death wish. Now that's getting deep when you start to see that, you know, knowing the right, he mentions that in Lesson 50. Being liked, he mentions, and knowing the right people are two of his things that believing you're sustained by something other than the love of God. He mentions those specifically there. So, let's do it. So, let's go over everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is our wedding. <laughs> this is our union. <laughs> the one that lasts forever. <laughs> it never has a beginning and never never ends, where the love never dies, or fades. So the idea of, of a wedding, and uh, like we were supposed to have today. <laughs> might have. Uh, might have. <laughs> so, so if we should perceive it in a way that would be useful to us, how do we perceive a wedding in the world? We see it as a symbol of love, and in this case, a symbol of the, the whole relationship. And we see it as, uh, as a, a way, a part of the path that, that we walk. Because the, the idea that to attach to nothing in the world, to, to realize that everything is the seeking of pain, pleasure, death, harm, could put you in a position of um, pure apathy. Because you have the, still have the notion of, I am a doer of some kind, so I want to do something. Um, but then, so, the idea of getting married is doing, but is this, is also undoing in, in the form that, that we're talking about it today. It's interesting too that, that if you throw the word out wedding or marriage on planet Earth, then it has a context, and that context is it's an event. Yeah. I've talked to women who said, I visualized my wedding since I was 
seven years old, and they, it's been, I visualize my wedding day um, for years and years and years, sometimes 10, 15, 20, 30 years, to visualizing this day, and this day is an event. And so what we can say is, when we talk about an event, events only could even seem to exist on the timeline. There are no events in eternity. If everything is, is, is pure spirit and oneness, then any event would be to try to take a small little seam out of the quantum field, to use a physics, quantum physics term, the quantum field where everything is connected, everything is pure energy, everything is unified. That's why they call it the unified field. But to pull an event out of mm. the quantum field and give it a name, mm. wedding yeah. or marriage or whatever, is no different than trying to pull a glass out of the quantum field. It's the same mm. thing. Pulling an event called marriage is the same as pulling this glass. And that's why in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you could receive vision. He's talking about the vision of Christ, the light beyond this world. You could receive vision from a table if you remove all of your ideas, he says in the workbook, from the table. So size, shape, texture, color, covering, um, height, width. Um, that, that sound has a lot of past associations in it. If I go like that on the table, already the egoic mind has a determination for that table. It's, this has a, this has a wood association, this has a tile So You see that even the sounds, everything, Everything that's perceived is coming from an association of separation, including the event called marriage. It has to come from a past reference. How would you know what a marriage yeah. would be? And then the other thing that's funny about marriages is, and the funny thing about events is, they seem to be subject to a number of things. One of them, though, is happen or don't happen. Did the wedding happen? Or did the wedding not happen? You see how it, mm -hmm. true marriage of, we'll call it the union of spirit, there's not a question of happen or not happen. Mm -hmm. It isness isn't subject to happenings or not happenings. Mm -hmm. And then we get deeper into this idea of hypotheticals because here we are in this instance right now and and then the wedding, the question about the wedding, becomes what? A hypothetical question. It's the Course, in the, in the clarification of terms, Jesus says, the mind is described as if, he puts as if, Jesus puts them in italics, mind is described as if it has two parts, which is what the Course is about, right mind and wrong mind. The mind is described as if, and he puts those two words out of that, a whole sentence in italics. Yeah. So, whatever is an event on, we'll say, the event horizon, any event in time and space has to be an as-if event. And as if what? Yeah. As if what? As if the separation occurred. Because the whole teachings of the Course are that the atonement is, the ex is total escape from the past and a complete lack of interest in the future. That's how he defines atonement. So you can see how it, was, how it zooms into an experience. Total escape from the past, complete lack of interest in the future. That fits in with our no ambition thing. So, so basically, marriage, as it's described in this world, is, is on the timeline. But you are asking it the question of how do I perceive the marriage in a helpful way? That's your question. Now having all said what I said, the only thing that could make anything helpful at all with regard to the symbols of the world is one simple question. What is the purpose? Because if it first of all doesn't have any true existence, it's just a symbol. It's, a, it's actually a symbol of symbol twice removed from reality, because when we use the word marriage we're, we're into 
twice removed from reality of that. But what is it for? So, you know, in our t talks with Sally Ann on <coughs> Skype last night, in our uh, in my talks with Yanni during the drive down here, after he picked us up at the airport and everything, I was in the front seat saying, I really enjoy your ancestors. He's you did Plato and Socrates. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I was really going with the, the core of why I'm in Greece, or why I seem to be in Greece, is for the depth of the wisdom of the ancient Greeks who sat in the pools all day long. They didn't build, they didn't have careers, they did nothing. They sat in the hot tub all day long, pondering one question, what is it for? That's why they weren't out building statues and Roman columns. It was the neighbors over in Italy, and we still have the Catholic Church and all that over there. You know, that's, that's what happens when you start building. Yep, they were it, kind of crazy. Beware of building. <laughs> Sit in the pool. <laughs> and meditate and contemplate and ponder before you move the baby finger to start to build, because look what we've got next door. I haven't been there ever, so I'm just talking about hypotheticals. Somebody's told me that they have a lot of columns over there, and Caesar, and gosh, all these kind of things. But it's this building idea, that was the problem of the whole thing. So, so what is a wedding for? And then, that's what I shared with Sally Ann, it's for joy, it's for love. When people have said, um, I was in Dallas, Texas one time, uh, a suburb north of Dallas, and uh, I was hosted by an Indian family, and uh, his, the, the husband who invited me there, his name was Arvind, he was an Indian man, and then we would have these sessions in the morning, sessions in the afternoon, and then Actually, in the middle of the day, everybody brought food. So they had like six cakes and pies, and it was this giant Course in Miracles retreat potluck. And as we all came together and were cutting the food, and it's vegetarian, meat, and all, everything in there. Huge thing. Arvin gets his glass and he goes, David, 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 David. Every time we eat a bite of food, we are reinforcing the separation. Mm. Every time we eat and chew and digest the food, and look at all the food we've got, we are reinforcing the separation. <laughs> this is Arvind Kumar. So, I said, that is not a reason to eat. So he said, David, okay then, please tell us. And I said, why do you eat, Arvind? Why do I eat? Why do I eat? I, I eat because I'm hungry. I said, that is not a good enough reason to eat. That is not a good enough reason to eat. There has to be more reinforcing the separation with every bite and chewing. It can't <laughs> end there. It can't. The reincarnation ideas in there, our ideas, that is not... <laughs> Even in the Matrix, one of the Matrixes, we, because this is our karma, that why, why do you, are you, well, it is our karma. I had that question just recently in Portugal, yeah. but what is karma? I said, didn't you ever hear the Beatles? Inst instant karma. John Lennon solved that one in his song, Instant Karma. But, so they said, okay everybody, let's hear it. David, why shall we eat? And I said, we will eat for joy. Yeah. Yeah. That is the only thing. It is a celebration mm -hmm. of our creation mm -hmm. by God. It is a celebration of the Christ. It is a celebration of divine innocence. It is a celebration of who we are. We will eat for joy. It's a, okay everybody, <laughs> you heard it from David. We will eat for joy. And it was. It was an extremely joyful lunch because the focus had shifted from the metaphysics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was like taking yeah. an intellectual understanding of the Course and projecting it onto chewing and eating the food. We are reinforcing the separation every time we eat. No, there are no actions in, the, in this world that reinforce the separation. Jesus says, it is with your thoughts alone that we must 
work. He never goes into morality. He never gets into ethics. He never gets into, some even spiritual teachers talk about right action. And Jesus never really gets into right action even. That's a common word in some spiritualities, right action. He's always talking about right-mindedness. Yeah. And what right-mindedness is, is it's causation. All right-mindedness is seeing that your mind is causative, and you are not at the mercy of anything of this world. That nothing of the world has the power to give you peace or take it away. There's no causation in the world. There's nothing in form. Food doesn't make you fat. The lack of food doesn't make you skinny. Caffeine doesn't keep you up at night. You know, you could go on and on and on with thousands of what Jesus calls spurious cause-effect relationships, which are much to do about nothing, as Shakespeare said, because they're all based on that. So actually, the short answer to your question is, is in the hypothetical situation that there is an event called a wedding, it would have to be for joy. It, it couldn't actually be for another reason, and that's why it's, you know, we're asked not to seek for the truth, but to seek and find everything that blocks us from the aware, awareness of love's presence. We're asked to look for the obstacles. We're not asked to seek for what is true. We're actually told at one point to seek for what is false. If you're going to be a seeker, Jesus says, don't seek for the truth. Don't be a truth seeker, be a false seeker. Because the false is what blocks you from the truth. The truth just is, and everything that you value that is, is hold, held as important is a block to the awareness of that truth. So typically, why do people get married? On the linear timeline, they get married for sometimes financial security. They get, they get married for the sex. They get married for the sex. They get married for the sex. I remember one time I was reading this researcher named Cher Height, and she interviewed all these single people and all these married couples. And she gave them all these questions, and she said to all the married couples, what is the greatest thing about being married? And what is the worst thing about being married? Then she turned to the single people, and she said, what is the greatest thing about being single? What's the worst thing about being single? Guess what the answers were? Overwhelmingly, the married couple said the greatest thing about being married was intimacy. And the worst thing about being married was loss of freedom. They interviewed the single people. What's the greatest thing about being single? Freedom. And what's the worst thing about being single? Loneliness, isolation, lack of intimacy. Now, we come above sheer height to the, to the Master Jesus. And what does Jesus have to say? He says, freedom is not of the body. He says, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind. For both you cannot have. You have to make a choice between freedom of the body and freedom of the mind. What is freedom of the body? Freedom of mobility, all the people, the people that were single. Freedom to travel, freedom of mobility of the body, not tied down by family life, not tied down by attachment. Don't you see these categories of humans coming in? They're trying to answer anything that goes in the direction of believing that you can actually have freedom in a body is part of a distortion, is part of an egoic belief that you can actually find freedom in and through the body. When Jesus says the only use of the body is, is an instrument for the Holy Spirit, it's a communication device for the Holy Spirit. He says that in a number of places. He actually slips one zinger in there. Some of the people have never found it in the Course, but I found it. The body has no purpose. He actually slips it in there. He slips a mickey. In the whole thing. It was too strong for the ego to say that, but he, you know, soul, communi communication, communication, and then there's no purpose. Because forgiveness, in the end, when you go back into the unified field, where does this 
This, this is gone in the happy dream, it's gone in the forgiven world, it's gone in thinking of it as something in and of itself. It's just back into the field, it's back in the dance with everything else. So, and I think that's the same thing with with the freedom for the single people, then it's the same for the intimacy, because Jesus says, minds are joined, bodies do not. That's pretty clear. That, that addresses intimacy. That you can't, you won't achieve revelation, you know, through the body. That that's purely an identification and an opening to the great rays in the mind. But that, if you really start to see that, you see that that intimacy attempted through the ego's means of finding intimacy results in still unfulfillment. And we could say that even with marriage attempts, that's one of the biggest reasons. Maybe financial security could be one, could be, you know, sex. It could be the procreation of the species, believing in linear time and thinking you have to Virginia Woolf, you know, procreate, and so on and so forth. You know, really if we look at our reasonings, you can start to see as you go through it, that there must be a reason for marriage that's beyond any of those things. Because they're all temporary. They're actually part of the hiding instead of the finding. It's for, seek not outside yourself or it will fail, Jesus says, and you will weep each time an idol falls. So any time the purpose is for trying to fill a gap, you know, they always say, I had to meet my other half. I, or sometimes they even use better half. There's a little comparison in that. <laughs> meet my better half. Mm. I don't know if I want to. <laughs> if you're that lacking, <laughs> if I would really want to meet your better half. <laughs> because, because that's the sense of trying to look for fulfillment in in another, in duality. And that's the most common thing. It's almost like, you and me against the world. Sometimes it feels like you and me against the world. It's like batting down the hatches. It's that hostile, vicious world. And I find my soulmates so like, when all the others fall away, you can count on me to stay. You see, it's like batting down the hatches. We've got a hell of a storm called linear time. It's, it's, it's like the perfect storm for the ego. It's the storm that's unsolvable. It's the storm that never seems to stop while you're in it. Death, sickness, disease, hammer you. Get your insurance, quick! Do some aerobics. Get your heart rate up, you know, do, oh, nutrition. You better watch what you eat, because death, the grim reaper, is always there, ready to take your life. Or you're caught in a storm, a tsunami or something, and like a little leaf snuffed out. Because it's a death wish, this is this whole world is. So, so oftentimes that's another reason why the, the idea of marriage comes in is this companionship. And you know Jesus actually addresses companionship even in the Course. Does anybody remember what he says? He says, he says, you really believe you are alone unless you are with another person. That's true. He actually is addressing companionship as specialness, companionship as a defense against the truth. Like sickness, 136, sickness is a defense against the truth. Ultimately, ultimately companionship, remember, it's a concept, yeah. is a defense against the truth. And that's another reason why people get married. If you have to really look at the reasons to get married. If our couple re reviews my teachings today, <laughs> after the fact, we might even talk about a few of these things when they come. But, this is what it comes down to. It's more of, it's not really a question of should I get married or, or should I stay single. It's more a question of what is the purpose? Am I going to give this symbol mm -hmm. of a couple or whatever over to the Holy Spirit to use mm -hmm. to unwind my mind from every single concept 
that I believe. Am I going to use the mirroring of that for the purpose of letting go of everything? Like Buddha said, empty your mind. For emptying your mind of everything, then that would be a worthy purpose. That would be, that would be the, sh the answer. That's a long answer. I gave the short answer ten minutes ago. <laughs> so it gives us steady our feet, our Father. Like how do we come to stability and steadiness? Steady our feet. Let me see. Let me truly see what this is about. It's more not what am I going to get out of the marriage, but what am I going to give. Mm. What is my purpose? What's my purpose? Now this is a ring. It's on a finger. I use it for illustrative purposes. It's a circle. It has no beginning and no end. So it's a symbol. People call it a ring or whatever. It's not. It's not. It's not representing an event on the timeline. Mm -hmm. It's just a device, it's a symbol being used by the Holy Spirit right now, mm -hmm. as a reminder of our purpose. Which, which is not, doesn't have beginnings and ends. You can't say, I'm going to begin forgiveness today. And I hope to reach the end of it. What's the thing you like to say in your gathering recently? Francis looked at the crowd, everyone was saying, how many steps are there in forgiveness? Is it two steps, three steps, and everything? Twelve steps. Twelve steps. Sixteen. We are the living forgiveness. We are the living forgiveness. Or I like what you said. I, like I am forgiveness. Mm -hmm. She spoke mm -hmm. the truth. And then we got an email this morning from that. There where somebody showed up as a devotee. I want to come and you know, I, I see that you are teaching mysticism. I, I won't even bother to talk about what's going on in my timeline. I just want to come, give myself over to that. I am forgiven. <coughs> yes, that's, that was beautiful. That was a beautiful email. Mm -hmm. I saw that. She cc'd her partner too, so that's, <laughs> that's good. That'll be interesting. <laughs> how the, it's fun to see how it plays out. But she was making her stand. Like, I recognize and I want to devote myself to that recognition of I am forgiveness. Because Francis was speaking too, that forgiveness isn't specific. You know, the Bible said forgive seven times seventy. Mm -hmm. And I've already tried that. That's 490 times I already did that. It didn't work. But it was just meaning a lot. But actually it's not really a lot. Forgiveness is a state of mind, it's a presence in which you see the false as false. It's, it doesn't really apply to forgiving Aunt Jane or Uncle Fred, forgiving your mother, forgiving your father, forgiving your son, your daughter. It's way, 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 way beyond that. And it seems to be a practice, but it's actually not a practice at all. It's actually a presence inspired by joy, inspired by happiness. Yeah, you think.